Hello and welcome to the Complete History of Science podcast. How is history made? Well, in the 19th century, the historian and philosopher Thomas Carlyle formulated a theory which became known as the Great Man Theory of History. Carlyle believed that historical events were largely shaped by the actions of great men. Men who through their intellect, or perhaps their political leadership or military skill, shaped the course of history. And it's true that history seemingly provides many examples of such men, whether it be Napoleon, who shaped the political map of 19th century Europe, or Julius Caesar, whose actions led to the downfall of the Roman Republic. In more recent times, we might also reformulate the great man theory to include female figures such as Margaret Thatcher, who dismantled the post-war welfare state in the UK, and whose influence has shaped the political status quo across the Western world. However, the great man theory of history is largely out of favour with most modern historians. History is frequently too complex to be explained by the actions of a single individual, however strong-willed that person may be. Instead, history can be viewed as a consequence of the collective actions of millions of little people, as well as the institutions, culture, and societies which those individuals produce. In this view, society at large creates the material conditions necessary for so-called great individuals to act. The great man theory of history, however, is still interesting to consider in the context of the history of science. In science, there are undoubtedly some men of genius, Archimedes, Newton, Einstein, von Neumann. Each possesses a creative and analytical intellect which is difficult for most of us to comprehend. But they were also born at the right time, into societies in which they could fully use their gifts. Scientific advancement, then, is contingent on both of these conditions. Breakthroughs happen when an idea is ripe and the prerequisite discoveries have already been made. But... Science also requires great thinkers to make these intellectual leaps. And in the Greek world of the 2nd century BC, astronomy was ripe for a great leap forward. Eudoxus' mathematical models of the solar system had stimulated many other geometers to try and improve on his models. Likewise, as we discussed in the last episode, Aristarchus had demonstrated to the Greek thinkers who followed that geometric models might go hand in hand with observation. And stepping into this world was Hipparchus of Nicaea. Hipparchus was born around the 2nd century BC in the Greek city-state of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey. Hipparchus was possibly the greatest astronomer of antiquity and the discoverer of several astronomical phenomena. What set Hipparchus apart from his contemporaries was his reverence for measurement and observation. To give an example, Hipparchus made improvements on Aristarchus' measurement of the size and distances of the sun and moon. Like Aristarchus, he constructed geometrical models of the Earth, sun and moon, but unlike Aristarchus, it's clear he derived his values from observation. Consequently, Hipparchus' estimates are much more accurate. For example, his value of the distance to the moon was around 67 times the radius of the Earth only around 10% greater than the correct value of 60 times. Hipparchus' obsession with measurement and records also led to perhaps his most surprising achievement, the discovery of the procession of the equinoxes. As discussed, Hipparchus was the first Greek astronomer to fully accept observation as an essential component of astronomy. His predecessors had left some records, for example, Timo Charis, who lived in the 3rd century BC, had left some scattered observations of the positions of several stars. Hipparchus, however, greatly expanded on these observations, and in doing so, noticed that during the two centuries which had elapsed between these measurements, the constellations had consistently shifted around two degrees eastward on the celestial sphere. He then noticed the same anomaly in the position of other stars of the zodiac. In modern terms, This happens for the following reason. The Earth is tilted on its axis with respect to the Sun at an angle of 23.5 degrees. 
This axis, however, rotates, which is known as precession. This means that over time, the Earth will point in a different direction compared to the stars, which change their relative position in the night sky. For example, the current pole star Polaris will over time shift away from the North Pole. This change takes place over a very long time period, roughly 26,000 years, to complete one rotation. While he can't have fully grasped these implications, Hipparchus's respect for observation meant that he didn't dismiss this as some error, but insisted it must be a real phenomena. Because these observations by Chimocharis were dated, Hipparchus was able to calculate that the longitudes of the stars were changing at a rate of around 1 one-hundredth of a degree per year. However, Hipparchus' importance in the history of science goes beyond any individual discovery. Hipparchus' greatest achievement was as a figure in the development of astronomy as a science. To understand this contribution, it's best to look at an example. As we've already discussed several times, the seasons, or more specifically the times between the solstice and the equinox, varies. Hipparchus improved upon previous approximations and took his own definitive measurements of the lengths of the seasons. These were spring, 94 and a half days, summer, 92 and a half days, autumn, 88 and 1 8 days, and winter, 98 and 1 8 days, which sums to 365 and a quarter days. Hipparchus then used these measurements as a basis to improve upon the previous models of the sun's motion. When Eudoxus had created his solar models some 300 years earlier, he'd made several assumptions not based on observation. Eudoxus, like many Greeks, considered that the heavens must be perfect, and hence decided that the sun should orbit in a circle at a constant speed. This was purely speculative, and in some ways a quasi-religious assumption, reflecting Greek astronomy's origins in philosophy. It was also impossible to reconcile with the data, which clearly showed that the seasons last for different periods. Hipparchus instead demonstrated, the model can be made to work if we simply assume the Earth is not at the centre of the orbit. The Sun still travels at a constant speed, in a circular path, but because it is now centred at a point other than the Earth, it appears to spend longer in some quadrants than in others. Hipparchus, a great mathematician as well as scientist, worked out a detailed geometric model for the Sun's motion, based on his observations. It's worth noting, we can't credit Hipparchus with the idea of an off-centre orbit, which was first suggested by Apollonius of Perga in the 3rd century BC. However, the key difference is, like his contemporaries, Apollonius was unconcerned with fitting his models to data, and was only interested in the broad strokes of the theory. Hipparchus's real contribution in the history of science was to assert that a mathematical model should be worked out in detail and be consistent with observations. Unlike earlier astronomers, Hipparchus had no time for philosophical ideas about the perfections of the heavens, and was prepared to drop assumptions from his models when they were shown not to fit with the data. After Hipparchus, astronomy didn't change into a science overnight, but he did start the long process of insisting that scientific models should be based upon and measured against empirical data. This was a new way of working in the 2nd century BC, and it's one that persists to the present. Science can advance mathematical and physical models for how the world works, but unless these models conform to reality, they aren't accepted. Models also need to be able to make predictions, and Hipparchus' solar model was so successful in that regard, it could predict the position of the Sun at any time to within one arc minute, a much smaller interval than could be directly measured. Likewise, he was able to improve upon the estimate for the length of the tropical year, and attained a value which was only out by about six minutes from the modern accepted value. Part of his success depended on his improved use of scientific equipment compared to his predecessors. Hipparchus mainly worked on the island of Rhodes, on which he set up an observatory using the latest modern instruments available at the time. 
For example, the simple nomon was superseded around this time by the superior quadrant, sometimes called a meridian quadrant. A quadrant is a device, usually a quarter circle, which can measure an angle up to 90 degrees. This was set in the plane of the meridian, that is, along a line of longitude, so that it can measure the angle of the sun's rays. It's possible, though unlikely, that Hipparchus was the inventor of the quadrant, but what is certain is that he used the quadrant to make his more accurate estimates of the seasons. The quadrant itself would continue to be an incredibly important device in the history of astronomy until fairly modern times, and was also a key device for navigation in the following centuries, as it allows a measurement of latitude, even at sea. In addition to making his own observations, Hipparchus was also the first Greek astronomer to recognise the immense value of the astronomical records which had come down from the Babylonians. The Greeks had long recognised that the Babylonians, whom they called the Chaldeans, were great astronomers. However, Hipparchus was the first to begin to use their huge body of data to improve his own celestial models. An example is Hipparchus's theory of lunar motion. Hipparchus used the Babylonians' observations of the lunar cycles and updated them with his own. Using this, he was able to create a reasonably accurate model of the moon's motion. I say reasonably because in reality, the moon's motion is much more complicated than many people realise. For example, most people take the lunar month to be 28 days, but if we were to measure the time it takes for the moon to go through its phases, that is from one new moon to the next, it's actually 29 and a half days, called the synodic month. This is also different from the time it takes to complete one orbit about the Earth. The moon's orbit, like most celestial bodies, is elliptical, but this ellipse itself is processing. In simple terms, this means that the elliptical orbit doesn't stay still, but rotates and does so with a period of around nine years. Overall, this means it takes approximately 27 and a half days to make one complete orbit of the Earth, which we call the anomalistic month. The complexity of lunar motion meant it wasn't possible for Hipparchus to model it with a simple off-centre rotation. So, Hipparchus introduced what is known as an epicycle. Essentially, an epicycle is an additional smaller orbit which a celestial body makes while also following a larger circle known as the deferent. Introducing epicycles would from this point become a standard trick used for centuries by astronomers to describe the motion of celestial bodies as circular, when in reality their orbits are elliptical. While the epicycle was again the invention of the mathematician Apollonius, Hipparchus was the first to apply it in detail to the orbit of a celestial body. By using Babylonian observations as well as his own, Hipparchus could calculate the necessary parameters, such as the rate of rotation of the epicycle and deferent, which allowed him to make reasonable predictions for the longitudinal position of the moon. Hipparchus's model is actually even more complex than the epicycle deferent one I've described, as the moon is also orbiting in a slightly different plane from the sun, offset at an angle of around 5 degrees. The reason this is important is because taking it into account allows eclipses to be described and predicted. Based on the parameters which Hipparchus calculated for his model, it could reasonably make predictions for lunar eclipses, though solar eclipses, with their much smaller shadows, were more difficult. Hipparchus's successors would attempt to improve upon his lunar theory to make better estimates of the solar eclipses, but it wasn't until Tycho Brahe and eventually Edmund Halley that solar eclipses would finally be predicted. Despite having derived very accurate solar and lunar theories, Hipparchus didn't create a similar theory of the motions of the planets. The reasons for this are unclear, because he did make extensive observations of the planets. Hipparchus instead used his observations to demonstrate that the models of his predecessors were highly inaccurate, and the planets, with all their retrograde motions, are immensely difficult to predict. It would take another astronomer, Ptolemy, 
to finally create an accurate planetary theory, some 200 years later. We'll discuss this in the next episode in detail. However, it's worth noting now the debt which Ptolemy owes Hipparchus. Much of Ptolemy's work makes direct use of Hipparchus' theories, in particular his solar and lunar models. And even his planetary theories make use of both Hipparchus' observations as well as adapting his epicycle deferent models. Historically, everything we know of Hipparchus' work actually comes through Ptolemy, whose great book The Almagest became the most influential scientific work of the ancient world. The Almagest was so great and so complete that it meant that older works such as those of Hipparchus were never copied or handed down. However, if it hadn't been for Hipparchus, it's arguable the Almagest may never have existed. Hipparchus, more than any other individual in the ancient world, put astronomy on a firmly scientific footing, and in the process, created arguably the first true science. <laughs> ¶¶